Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a cashier in a bank and a customer. The customer is asking for advice about traveler's checks. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. How can I help you? Yes, hello. I'm going away on holiday next month and I was wondering if you could give me some advice about travellers' checks. Yes, of course. Where are you off to? Anywhere nice? To France. To Paris for a week. Oh, lovely. So, how many checks would you like to order? Well, before I do, are they the best option, travellers' checks? Well, they're certainly safer than taking cash. If they get lost or stolen, they can be replaced, usually within 24 hours. It's a good idea to have a small amount of cash, though, for snacks and taxis, that sort of thing. Yes, that's what I was thinking. What about my credit card? Are there any charges for using it abroad? No, it's debit cards that get charged for ATM withdrawals, not credit cards. And remember, anything you buy with a card might be covered by insurance. So if something you buy turns out to be faulty or... Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. So it's probably a good idea to do all three then. Traveller's checks, credit card, some cash, yes? Yes. So how many traveller's checks would you like? I was thinking about £300. How long will they take to arrive? It depends. If you order before half past two between Monday and Thursday, you'll have them the next day by 10am in the branch. Or if we post them to you, you'll have them by 5 p.m. Oh, but I was hoping I could order them today. That's okay. Orders taken at any time on Saturday will be here in the branch at 10 a.m. on Tuesday or delivered to your home by Tuesday at 1.30. Okay, that's all right. I don't mind waiting until then. Can I order them now? Yes. Have you got an account with us? Yes. Here's my credit card. Thanks. Let's just log in and I can place an order for you. Could you confirm your date of birth? 15th of the 3rd, 1975. What's the commission on the checks, by the way? It's 1.5%. That's pretty standard, I think you'll find. And what happens if I don't spend them all? Will I be able to bring them back? Yes, no problem. We buy them back and there are no additional charges or conditions of return. So, would you like me to go ahead and place an order? Yes, yes please. Will you be coming in to collect them? I don't think I'll have the chance to come into the branch on Tuesday. 
Could you send them to my house? No problem. Can I just check your address? 54 Tavistock Road? Yes, that's right. Postcode CB13LR? That's it, yes. OK. So that's £300 worth of traveller's checks? Yes, please. Now, what about euros? Would you like to order any? No, no thank you. I still have some at home from the last holiday. I forgot to change them at the airport when we got back. I was going to give them to our daughter, but I'll treat myself for a change, I think. Good idea. So, £300 in traveller's checks. Could I ask you to sign here to confirm the order? Thank you. OK, that's done for you. Your checks will be with you by 1.30 Tuesday. Someone will need to be at home to sign for them. Will that be OK? Yes, I'll be at work, but my husband will be in. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. Have a lovely holiday. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an interview with a student advisor on a podcast. The advisor is giving financial advice for overseas students going to the UK to study at university. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to our monthly podcast for overseas students planning to study in the UK. This month we're looking at how to make your money last longer while studying here. And to help us find some bargains, I have Jenny Lubeck from the Student Union. Jenny, students are renowned for being hard up, but there are lots of savings to be made, aren't there? Well, as soon as students start their course at university or college, they'll be able to buy their NUS Extra card. This will enable them to get a wide range of discounts on essentials like books, clothes and eating out. The card only costs about £12 for one year, and for about the same amount you can include an ISAAC card. The ISAAC is an internationally recognised discount card for full-time students. Discount offerings vary and usually include things like travel, guidebooks, music, eating out, that kind of thing. Students are told all about this when they start their studies, but if your listeners want to find out more about these cards before they arrive, I've put some details of websites on the podcast page. Now, travel costs can mount up for students, can't they? I know the Isaac card is useful here, but are there any other things students should be aware of? Understandably, lots of overseas students like to take the opportunity to travel around the country whilst they're in the UK. And, for this reason, I'd strongly recommend they invest in a young person's real card. To be eligible, you need to be between 16 and 25. Mature students over the age of 25 can also apply, so long as they're in full-time education. You can buy a one-year or three-year card and it gives you a third off rail journeys across the UK. The card also gives you access to competitions and things like theatre discounts and holiday offers. At the moment, a one-year card costs £28 and it's £65 for a three-year card. Before you hear more of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. And what about buses? Um, well, as well as the rail card, it's also more than likely the local bus operators will offer discounted bus travel with their own travel cards. These aren't aimed specifically at students, but can still save you a lot of money if you use the buses regularly. You can usually get these cards for a week, a month, a term, or a whole year, with bigger savings the longer the period. Another advantage of these cards is that, as well as making it cheaper to commute to and from university, you'll also find them very handy free transport whenever you need to do some shopping or visit friends in your area. Are there any cultural things that students coming to the UK might not be aware of that can save them money? Some overseas students are surprised by the amount of recycling that goes on in the UK and how much money can be saved in the process. There'll be a roaring trade in used course books in the student union on campus. Lots of students who were on the same course as you the year before will be selling their books at the end of their course. They'll be a lot cheaper than buying them new. Off campus, you'll find lots of charity shops in your local town centre with a good selection of novels. And you'll often get some really nice clothes, CDs and DVDs that people have donated and all at very cheap prices. Of course, shopping in this way means you're contributing to a worthwhile cause as well. And check your local paper frequently for car boot sales. Car boot sales are a very British style of market, where private individuals come together to sell home and garden goods. In fact, they're a great way of recycling some of your own unwanted stuff and can help you make some money in the process. Finally, there are websites and mailing lists where local people offer up items they no longer want for free, as long as you agree to collect them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor answering students' questions about using the college intranet. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi everyone. I know you have lots of questions about the college intranet. My inbox is full of messages. I thought it would be quicker and more useful to come in and talk to you rather than respond to all the messages. I'm happy to answer or try and answer any questions you have about how to use it when we'll be making things available online. I'm the ICT champion for the department, so hopefully I'll be able to help. Yes, Mark, fire away. Can you tell us when the assignments are going to be put online? If you're talking about your second assignment, that should be on already. I uploaded it last Monday. Wait a minute, let me check the schedule. Mm, here we are. No, tell a lie. It was the following day, the 14th. Tuesday, the 14th of October. Have you logged into the intranet yet? No. If the assignments there are downloaded after we've finished, are you putting all the assignments up? Yes, I've been waiting for your subject tutors to email them to me. As soon as I have them all, I'll put them online. There's a deadline of the 24th of November. All course assignments need to be online by then. That's college policy for all staff, so they'll be there then for sure. Will there be anything else? 
timetables, trip information, that kind of thing. Only there wasn't much online for our course last term. I know, but we're making more of an effort this time. We'll be releasing your marks for the first assignment soon. That'll be the 17th of November. You'll find them in your My Grades area. Again, the timetables are already there, Mark. You need to log in. I made these available at the beginning of term in September. According to the schedule here, the booking forms, for those who want to go on the Belgium trip, will be available next week on the 29th of October. So don't forget to check then. You need to get these back to us quickly if you want to go. The trip's coming up soon, isn't it? Let's see. Yes, the 19th of November. Now, remember, there are lots of learning materials on the internet as well. Quizzes, web links. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Sir, wouldn't it be easier if we were just given the documents, so we don't have to go online to get them? I know it seems a little frustrating, Claire, but we're doing it this way for a good reason. We're trying to cut down drastically on the amount of paper we get through. I'm afraid that students are always losing documents we give out in class. So we've decided to stop doing this. You have a limited printing allowance, which means you'll probably be more careful with any documents you have to print off. Besides, it means you'll always know where the information is when you need it. If you're at home and you forget an important date or need a document urgently, you can always log into the internet and get it. You said something about quizzes, sir. Yes, we've had permission from the exam board to put some of their past papers online in an interactive form. That means you'll be able to get answers immediately with some feedback. They'll make a nice change from using the paper copies. Most of them are already online, and I'll be putting the rest on over the next couple of weeks. As I said, these are authentic past papers, so you'll get a really clear idea of your progress. Just to let you know, the technology tracks your scores, so your tutors will be able to tell who's having problems and what areas of the syllabus you might need help with so it's definitely worth spending some time doing them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a tutor giving a lecture on the subject of obesity. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 34. Good afternoon. Today we're continuing our investigation into obesity. We've looked at several factors causing obesity, including lack of exercise and a general sedentary lifestyle, and the role the media plays in promoting the consumption of high calorific food. In the coming weeks, we'll go on to examine serious eating disorders, such as anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. The decline in formal eating times within the family and the subsequent increase in the degree of snacking that takes place 
have had a significant effect on obesity. Today, we're going to turn our attention to an example of this, what has been termed emotional hunger or emotional eating, as opposed to the consumption of food to satisfy a physical need. Studies have uncovered how our emotional state can lead to us eating more than we physically need. It was originally believed that negative emotions brought on through depression or anxiety were the main cause of this, but it is now acknowledged that positive emotions can have a similar effect on our eating habits. Not everyone is susceptible to emotional eating, and even those who do suffer have highly individual symptoms. However, there are common themes. It seems that people who are already overweight are more susceptible to emotional eating when suffering negative emotions than those who are underweight. Equally, excessive eating of this kind can happen during or after happy events, when larger meals than normal tend to be eaten. Before you hear more of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. So, what are the signs that someone is eating to satisfy an emotional stimulus? Well, there are several differences between emotional and physical hunger. Those experiencing emotional hunger will feel the urge to eat all of a sudden. This compares to the gradual sensation of hunger that occurs with a physical stimulus. Interestingly, and I'm sure many of you will recognize this, when you're eating to satisfy an emotional need for food, the craving will often be for a specific item, like a pizza or something sweet like ice cream. In this kind of situation, nothing else will really satisfy the craving. When the urge to eat is driven by a physical need, you're far less bothered about what you eat. Emotional hunger makes the individual feel the craving must be satisfied immediately by whatever the specific kind of food is. I'm sure we've all experienced that feeling. I must have some chocolate now. In contrast, the need to satisfy sensations of physical hunger seems less urgent. Emotional eaters will carry on eating even when they're full. A person eating to satisfy a physical hunger will be more likely to stop. Finally, and probably not surprisingly, feelings of guilt often follow emotional eating, but not when eating normally. This has serious consequences for those working with patients suffering with obesity. One way to deal with this is to educate sufferers into understanding the different symptoms of physical and emotional hunger, and to try to help them identify the pressure points during a typical day when daily stresses occur. Being conscious of one's eating habits is the first step in dealing with the problem. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.